So let's start the session, and this is uh, session four, four um, B. Uh, this is face-to-face -face, uh, session, interdisciplinary track. Um, originally, there were four uh, different presentations, but uh, two people, one from Peru and one from um, uh, Mexico, they cannot attend here because uh, electronic visa issue. So uh, we, we are down to two presentations today. The first presenter is uh, me, Song No from Purdue University. The title of the presentation, as you can see in the screen, Unmasking Authorial Voices in Don Quixote. So it's a, a, a novel of Don Quixote. I'm doing a sort of a digital humanity analysis. Before I uh, talk about uh, my um, uh, analysis, I'll just do a little um, overview of general information about the text and then uh, the author. So as you can, most of you know, but just in case, so Don Quixote uh, has two parts. First one was published in 1605 and second one in 10 years later, 1615, written by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, and, uh, known as the most read text of the Bible and one of the most translated works in the world, and arguably regarding as a first modern uh, novel. So, and then about the author, uh, Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, 1547, he was born in Alcalá, Henares, Spain. And 1547 to 1556, uh, 1566, lived in, in Andalusian uh, areas, uh, such as Córdoba and Se Seville. And then 1566 to 1580, he moved back to Madrid. And then he got into some sort of uh, trouble, legal problem, so he has to escape uh, from Madrid and then he traveled to Italy and back then Italy, part, lots of part of Italy, especially Napoli and other parts were controlled by Spain, uh, Spanish um, uh, um, viceroys and then he went there to serve uh, some Spanish dukes and nobles there and so he served in military and participated in the War of Lepanto with, uh, back then, the new uh, Muslims, you know, uh, current Tur Turkey, uh, Turkey uh, uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire. And somehow he got captured and enslaved by the uh, pirates, the corsairs of Ottoman Empire. In 1580 and to 1616, he was freed and returned to Madrid, and after trying various jobs and tried to move to Americas, back then uh, Latin America was uh, a, a place to uh, become rich for many Spaniards. But he got all the permissions, but somehow he didn't move to uh, Latin America. And in 1584, married and stayed in Seville, Sevilla, uh, Seville, uh, Back then, and back then, as some of you can know, uh, Seville is uh, uh, the most uh, uh, developed and commercial uh, area for importation and exportation uh, between Spain or Europe and Latin America. And then he moved to Valladolid in 1604 and in 1605, published the first part of Don Quixote, and then 1615 published the second part and he died on the following year, 1616. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> and the first part of Don Quixote contains 52 chapters. <coughs> so, 
second part, 50, 74 chapters. And in terms of uh, the narrative uh, structure, the book one of the first part divided into four parts, actually. The first set consists of uh, eight chapters, so chapter one through eight. And then from the perspective of narrative studies, though, some dialogues between Don Quixote and characters uh, you can detect it there, and there are many uh, moments of soliloquies and the stream of consciousness of Don Quixote you know, himself. The noticeable evolution of narrative strategy is detected first when Sancho Panza joins uh, Don Quixote in the second Sally, and that's uh, chapter 9. And curiously enough, after the most remembered and commented episode of Windmills, chapter 8, uh, chapter 9, the debate between Don Quixote and Sancho about the windmills and enchantment went on. Subsequently, Don Quixote gets into a fight with the court herders and during his narration, Cervantes employs, for the first time, the interruption of sus suspenseful moment, which Ariosto and uh, other chivalric novels frequently take advantage of. You know, it does stop in one moment and one fight and then move on to, let me stop here and then let me go on to other uh, characters and, and go with that. So I think it's, uh, you know, sus sus uh, suspense of stop. I, I think some of uh, you are used to Korean drama or, or the Squid Game, and they use this type of techniques a lot. But these were developed uh, during uh, medieval time in in Europe, uh, and some of the uh, well recognized authors use this type of narrative techniques. Um, Cervantes excused himself that his narrative interruption is not his own, uh, rather that the original writer of Don Quixote in Arabic, Sid Hamete Benecheli. From this point on, whenever it deems to be mentioned, the Sid Hamete Benecheli intervene, and from time to time, Cervantes or the main character has an imaginary debate by questioning credibility of Sid Hamete Benecheli. In different times, the main, main narrator wants to remind the complex layers of storytelling, translating, and writing. And just briefly, uh, uh, I just I will delineate types of narrative voices in Don Quixote. So, uh, there are many voices, uh, narrative voices, but just uh, to uh, uh, simplify in these ways. So first one is enunciative entity that Miguel de Cervantes constitute as a true author. Two, the voice that represents the narrator of Don Quixote, the main narrator. And three, the set of fictitious authors. And you can see in number three, category, you, you have many, many, multiple different type of narrators. So in the first uh, uh, part, the enunciative identity of Miguel de Cervantes, just uh, very simple, the real author of Miguel de Cervantes appears on the cover and only makes the dedication to the Duke of Bejar, after which he already launches fictional, uh, fic uh, fictional speech. So. You know, right after uh, you know this serious uh, dedication, but then he already become ironic and playful and trying to you know uh, un, uh, uh, downplay his real uh, uh, identity and then trying to uh, present other type of narrative voices. However, in in the second part of uh, Don Quixote, which was uh, published in 1615, ten years after the first part. Cervantes, as the real author, meddles in the uh, prologue to the reader, which proceeds 
the dedication to the Duke of Lemos and refutes Avellaneda's authority over Don Quixote. Some names you are not maybe not familiar with, but the most important one would be uh, Avellaneda. No? He's the one who wrote the sequel, the fake sequel of Don Quixote after the first uh, 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 part of Don Quixote in 1605. So uh, Avellaneda's uh, sequel uh, of Don Quixote was really popular. And still, even these days, nobody knows who actually wrote Avellaneda. There's, you know, critics have some idea that who could have been Avellaneda. Uh, some say as Lope de Vega, great uh, dramatist of Spain, who wrote about at least 700 uh, theater pieces. So every time I joke around and whenever I talk to American students, uh, Shakespeare wrote less than 100 pieces of theater. And Lope de Vega wrote 700. And some people claim that he wrote 3,000. And we have, I think I lost the count, but we have about 900 titles of theater pieces by Lope de Vega. Uh, I think uh, they have, I think at least uh, three or four hundred, the complete text of Lope de Vega. So you can see the great figure. And Cervantes made, Cervantes made a fun of Lope de Vega in first part of Don Quixote. And then Lope de Vega was angry, so he made a fake second part right after the first part to insult uh, Cervantes, and that's why he did. And then this is the second part, finally, Cervantes wrote after 10 years after the publication. And then all the other fake second part became really popular in Spain. So he decided to write the second part. And uh, sorry for the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, giving out this information. But uh, second part, he purposely kills, Cervantes purposely kills Don Quixote. He dies so that uh, there won't be any more second part of, uh, the, the sequel, another sequel of second part of Don Quixote. However, however, this, uh, he, both, of he, uh, both of these parts were very popular. Therefore, um, after even the second part, there were different sequels of Don Quixote. And there are daughter, daughters of Don Quixote, and there are many other things uh, continued until even 21st century. So, okay. Thank you. And then second type of narrative voice, and that's a so-called main character and a main narrator. And sometimes critics, some critics get confused. They think this is Miguel de Cervantes, but uh, no, that's not. So at least you can see the, uh, this uh, main narrator who starts the first uh, 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 part of, first uh, chapter of Don Quixote. So there exists a main narrator in an anonymous voice. So omniscient narrator. No? who controls the entire text and discursive system. Perhaps this narrator needs to be distinguished since its entity is not the representative of collective constitution of implicit narrators who are quoted and mentioned in uh, indirect discourse. So just that, OK? And then third category, the set of fictitious authors. So there are so many. So. I just uh, narrow down to just the five uh, here. So first one is the, the prologue writer of the first part of Don Quixote. And the second one is unknown narrator of chapter one through eight. And then third would be Sid Hamed de Benengeli. And fourth would be the Moorish Al Hamiado. Al Hamiado is, uh, there are, all of you might know Spanish history. So Spain was invaded by Muslims in 711, and they, were, they occupied part, parts of the uh, uh, Iberian Peninsula 1492. So almost eight centuries uh, Spanish as uh, a Muslim presence in Iberian Peninsula. And there are many different type of linguistic uh, uh, evolution. So there are some uh, Spanish speakers who could write uh, Spanish in Arabic alphabets. And there were some uh, Arabic writers, uh, speakers, who could write 
Arabic in Spanish alphabet. So that's the <laughs> confusion. Are you going to say, huh? So, yes, yeah, some confusion was going on, and cultural exchange and mixture was very vibrant during that time. So Moorish al Khamiado is a, a Arabic person who wrote uh, Arabic in Spanish alphabet. Okay, and who knew? A lot of them back then, they were like, at least bilinguals or you know, trilinguals, because there were Jewish people as well, and there are many different uh, linguistic uh, dynamics going on in Iberian Peninsula. So then this Moorish al Khamiado as an anonymous tr translator of manuscript from Arabic to Spanish. And then there's academics of Argamasilla, authors of verses given to the main narrator in the last part of uh, chapter 52 of the first part of Don Quixote. So all these, uh, of course, invented uh, uh, narrators and authors in uh, Don Quixote. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about this character, Sid Hamid Benekhali. As you can see, uh, his name doesn't sound Spanish. And the Sid, some of you know, El Sid, and meaning in Arabic, meaning Mr. Sir in that way. So Sir. Hamete is sort of in Arabic, uh, I think some Arabic students here, so it's a sort of back then popular name. And then unpopular is name or invented last name, Benengheli. So some have different suggestions, and in Spanish, there's a word of Berenjena, which means eggplant, means in Korean, kaji, right? eggplant. So he, they're making, he's making something like uh, Sir John Berenkena, uh, Mr. John uh, Eggplant. That's pretty much uh, this fictitious name. Uh, it's a fictional character and narrator who, according to the principal narrator, wrote the original version of Don Quixote in Arabic. And see, the Hamete Benaheli is mentioned 41 times in the first and second books of Don Quixote. And the fictional character uh, narrator appears in chapter 9 of the first part of Don Quixote. So I just quote, verily and truly in English. Okay. All those who find pleasure in histories like this ought to all show uh, their gratitude to Sid Hamete, its original author, for the scrupulous care he has taken to set before us all its minute particulars not leaving anything, however trifling it may be, that he does not make clear and plain. So that's uh, Cervantes uh, portraying as Sid Hamid Ben And sometimes, you know, it's uh, about him, sometimes uh, the, the comments about him is kind of brief, but uh, in his, uh, he was uh, described as a quote, historian of great research and accuracy in all things, unquote. Uh, and uh, uh, chapter 16 and uh, chapter 22, 22, the Arab and Manchegan, Manchegan meaning uh, uh, Castilla de la Mancha, the central part of uh, Spain, sort of like, I would say, Chungcheongdo Chung in, in, in Korea, okay? So it's a uh, and uh, an Arab and Manchegan author relates in this most grave, high sounding, minute, delightful, and original history. And chapter 22 in the first part of Don Quixote. Very often, the words of Sida Hamete are found verbatim, meaning exactly the same, literally, literally, or in quotation marks. Likewise, the Arabic narrator is an important character in his own novel. He speaks and the others speak of him as happen with, uh, happens with the other characters. Uh, Howard Mansing, uh, one of the critics, uh, interprets this narrative intervention and uses the concept of metafiction dialectics to expose the unusual Cervantine uh, interaction and intertextuality between Sid Hamid ben Ali and the rest of fictional narrator. And then here, I think, uh, I, I just imagine some of the uh, uh, undergraduate students here, and they're wondering, metafiction, 
meta fiction, I think you, you, guys, you guys these days hear about meta universe, right? So different type of universe. So universe inside the universe, that kind of thing. So this is a meta fiction, meaning fiction inside a fiction. Okay? So, 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 so. So just uh, you know, following up on that, so in, in Don Quixote, there are many different type of fictions within the fiction Don Quixote. So it's not just one fiction about one character. It's a Don Quixote travels and he meets and they tell a story, or they even read without loud, loud uh, uh, novel. So a lot of <coughs> intersection and mixing of different genre. <coughs> so <coughs> some of you just think why <coughs> sorry <coughs> Cervantes is doing this type of experiment. Um, so we see the Hamete uh, entangles, mixes, no, breaks, dilates. Sometimes he, you know, make uh, things uh, unimportant or you know, emphasize, disrupts even authorial authority and unity. Consequently, Cervantes is gradually displaces his own novel, which becomes more obvious, particularly in the second part of Don Quixote. Don Quixote. The presence of Sid Hamete uh, effectively facilitates the vast polyphonic and pragmatic facilities in Don Quixote's discourse. And some of you are not in literature. Let me just you know explain this jargon. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, totally skipped. No. Okay, sorry about that. This part, just uh, polyphonic, nothing but poly meaning multiphonic sound, multiple voices, that's what it means, polyphonic, okay? So multiple uh, uh, voices in, in Cervantes' novel. So um, it's just being playful. Uh, sometimes he does something playful, but uh, so it's not for a comic re relief or for an excuse to shift readers' attention from one strain of uh, narration to another. Rather, it is unrealistic or realistic reminder of the complexity on the construction of narrative voices in modern novel. The authorial voice has to be self-conscious at all times and does not claim to the throne of omniscient narrator because the reality and human lives themselves are infinitely complex and layered. So just, uh, since we have lots of time, only two of us here, so let me take advantage and explain a little bit. What, what I want to say is, just like you all, I think I five or six people here, the reality of you see in this room is just a little part of you. you. You have different type of selves for your family members, professors, and, and different situation you behave and your different persona or identity comes out, right? So Cervantes as a first sort of like modern writer, he really wants to see it's not just you, but it's even the narrator himself. Narrator has this kind of complexity of, of, of self. Of course, uh, I don't know, young, young people here, especially undergrad student here, the concept of self, I, I know I love BTS song, Love Yourself. The concept of self is invention only, uh, it's been only a little bit over 100 years. Without Freud, we wouldn't have a human being human history wouldn't have recognized the existence of self, okay? So it took us, if we count it from 
uh, Greek and Roman time, it took like 5,000 years to discover self, okay? But in 2020, 2022, you guys sing BTS songs everywhere, and you think the self is something granted. No, it's not. And then, and then back then, during these times, 16th, 17th century, people thought just, I am constant. Everybody think, who, who think, whoever think you are moral, you are, you are very right, that think you, you only think about you are just one side. But no, we behave, we do things differently. I think that's what Cervantes really want to underline, that even narrator is sort of like character, has a personality, has an identity. We should not listen to narrator as a just voice, but there's some depth of that person. Yeah? So like, I don't know, some artist, if you think about, I, keep, I love K-pop, that's why I'm using it. You know, BTS songs, it's not all about one thing, they're like rebellious, but sometimes they talk about love songs, but sometimes they sing about how their, their relationship with uh, parents or something. Because all of you have very complex li lives, right? You're not just personal or sitting in, in, in the first row of the classroom. As soon as you go out, you do it. I don't know, you, you work part-time, you, you go home, you do different things. Or you, if you go to travel, uh, United States or a different uh, place that you when you speak English you, you use different personality different identity you use so all this and that's somehow Cervantes is trying to show that even not only just the, uh, you know just the each character but even the person who speaks person who only speak just of one vote with a one voice have multiple perspectives and multiple characters that's all so I don't want to make a blasphemy or insult your, 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 your religion, but if you read the Bible that way, that'll be revolutionary. Because the Bible, they always think they, they think they hear the voice of God. But God can have many voices in the Bible? Okay, I'll stop there. That's what uh, Cervantes used. I don't know, I always get excited about you know these type of things that my students think I'm overly excited, but okay, this is what it is. And then so another aspect of Sid Ahmed Benakeli is translate. Translation is important here. In fact, Cervantes re re reiterates that his readers are reading the translation of a translated work. So it's a double translation, meaning Sid Ahmed Benakeli wrote Don Quixote. And then the al Hamiado, the, the Moorish uh, the person who could write uh, Arabic in Spanish alphabet, al Hamiado of Toledo translated it from Arabic to Spanish. And Cervantes himself, the, the main narrator himself, is merely rewriting or editing the translated work of Cid Hamedes Don Quixote. This may sound comical or even worthy. At the same time, during the medieval period of, of Europe, the Muslims translated classical Greek and Latin text into Arabic. And early Renaissance scholars put efforts to retranslating some of them in Latin or in other vernacular language, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese. You know? And perhaps Cervantes comically states that Don Quixote is part of a such Renaissance. Uh, translation tradition. Okay, so I mean, you, you, you all study Arabic, and we look, if you study contemporary Arabic, I don't know, you you, you paid much attention to this, but I personally believe R European Renaissance couldn't have not been possible without Arabic text, which translated Plato, Socrates, Tessiani, Arabic of some Tessiani of Yeah, there's no. Uh, Socrates and Plato uh, uh, could have existed without the Arabic translation. And then those uh, humanists, Italian humanists or other European humanists, they retranslate those work from Arabic into uh, Latin or Italian or other languages. And I think Professor Kang, he has a presentation why the Renaissance was so popular in Italy, and you can see his study more uh, data science way. 
And here's just, uh, I'm doing a little bit of uh, data analysis here. So only thing, show that uh, here, the, this, pool, this part. So if you see P1, meaning part one, chapter one through 10, you see some mention of uh, Sid Hamed Ben Heli's name. And then it goes on. And when story becomes really thick and serious, and the second, uh, the late, later part, chapter 31 to the 52, you don't see Sid Hamed Ben Heli. In the second part, you can see his name was mentioned far many times. So stereotypically, when, when you see Don Quixote, you only see the picture of Don Quixote fighting with windmill. That's not, that's not Don Quixote, okay? Don Quixote has far more important chapter than just windmill. Windmill is, if you read even first part, 52 chapters, if you have a lot of patience, you will realize that windmill is nothing important compared to all other chapters. But somehow, stereotypically, people always think, don't kill them, women. Okay. All right. And then just a brief comment. Uh, the third point about Sid Hamed Ben Heli suggests that Cervantes was aware of Makama tradition of Arabic picaresque novel. And some of you say, huh? And Makama, Makama is a very famous uh, Arabic liter literary tradition during, uh, before, before uh, Cervantes' time. So Cervantes probably have known. On the one hand, it is evident that Cervantes has a depth of knowledge in narrative, particularly novelistic genre of his time, which reflects the chapters containing multiple types of novels, pastoral, chivalric, picaresque, sentimental, Italian, Italian novella type, epic, Etc., and then different treaties, philosophical, religious, and etc. treaties. Uh, and then Cervantes has studied much about uh, Arabic culture, not only due to his captivity years in Algiers, but also his humanistic interest in other cultures. Even though Cervantes does not make any specific reference to Arabic literature per se, the nature of Sid Hamete Ben Heli as an Arabic na uh, narrator is portrayed repeatedly as a liar, a storyteller, or a fiction monger, the one who promotes fiction, a fiction as an unreal and fabricated story. Such a notion is not far from what a narrator of Nakama tradition was perceived. Apart from this point, a number of critics have uh, analyzed that uh, notion of lying, untrustworthy, worthy. Muslims are based, uh, is based on the racist stereotype of Cervantes uses. So I'm not trying to make a Cervantes is like saint or someone perfect. He makes a lot of racist comments because he wanna avoid, he wanna, uh, one of the excuses would be he wanna avoid the uh, Inquisition. You know, Spanish Inquisition, they burn, not only burn books, but burn, burn people, you know, kill people. All the tor torture devices in Inquisition time and other racist stereotypes of Arabs during Cervantes time. But in the case of Soraida and Sancho's Moorish friend, uh, who was returning to Spain, there were cases that Cervantes offers somewhat positive and realistic portrayals of Moorish people. So it's not all Cervantes all racist or bad, but there are some uh, parts that he shows a sympathy or sometimes even respect to Arabic people. So it's a very, complicated text. It's not like something you can just, you know, simply stereotypically say one thing about the, uh, Don Quixote or even Cervantes. So I hope, uh, you know, along with your Squid Game and other K, K, move, K uh, cinema, I hope you can read uh, uh, Don Quixote and, and, and study about his narrative strategies. Thank you very much.